Right, so today I'm going to talk about visualizing uh, deep networks. And the uh, focus here is on education, so the educational aspect. And this is joint work with other people in Google under Google Research. But um, first, a little bit about my group. I am part of the Big Picture Visualization Group, and we're part of Google Brain. And the mission we have our group is to use data visualization to make machine learning uh, more transparent and easier to use. And some of our public work is uh, we did the graph visualizer for TensorFlow. So if you're playing with TensorFlow models and then you want to go and inspect and see the data flow graph, which is a bunch, uh, basically a set of nodes and um, tensors flowing through that, uh, our group did that. Uh, but here for this talk, uh, the question that I want to focus on is how do we explain deep learning and how do we uh, teach beginners a little bit about neural networks? And it's not enough to just teach equations because it's, uh, we have all these other tools and visualizations and, and interactive um, toolkits that we have developed that can help uh, engage students much, much uh, better. And uh, the other thing is that with deep networks is you have to tweak a lot of hyperparameters and you have to like change the network structure and it takes a serious amount of uh, work. You have to go change some file, run Python, restart it, kill the process. If you ran it in the cloud, you have to go and um, do it again. So for newcomers, that's, that's very hard to do if you just want to see and play a little bit with what neural network looks like. Um, the the visualization that we did was heavily inspired of uh, uh, work from Chris Olas. If you haven't seen his blog, I, I heavily, heavily recommend it. And Andre Karpati actually wrote a JavaScript library that does uh, uh, neural nets in the browser. And he has some visualizations. And these are powerful visual, like live animations and, and interactive um, visualizations of neural nets. And from there, uh, we uh, followed on that work and we wanted to like f uh, to f uh, make sure that we have this direct manipulation interface where you can control every single thing of a simple neural network through UI and you can do it rapidly and um, you can play it instantaneously and reverse it and share it with people and without further ado this is the the UI that we built just a little bit about the UI so uh, data flows from left to right and uh, the Square here that I'm uh, um, the square that I'm showing are the features. So the problem here is two-dimensional. There is x1 and x2, or you can call them x and y. Uh, but the user can also choose other features such as x1 square or x1 x2 or sine of x. Uh, on the right side, you have the output of the network, and the problem here is a simple two-dimensional classification problem where you have blue circles uh, that are positive examples and Orange circles um, are negative examples. And the background is what the network thinks for every possible hypothetical example in this unit square. So that is what the network thinks that that uh, pixel is, or that hypothetical circle is. In a way, it shows the generalization of the network. In the middle, you have these hidden layers where you can play with how many you want uh, of them and how many nodes. And on the left side, you can choose different data sets. And some of the data sets are are more tricky than others. Um, on the top, you have the hyperparameters, learning rate, activation functions, regularization, and we uh, also support uh, regression, not just uh, classification. And without uh, further ado, I want to show you a demo. But first, I wanted to mention that this is available on playground.tensorflow.org. And you can also, on GitHub, it's open source, so you can go and uh, check out the source code. So let's see, view and the full screen. All right, so I made the mouse bigger so you can easily follow. So I'm just going to click the play button here. Um, and you can see immediately, I'm actually going to lower a little bit the learning rate so that it goes a little bit slower. And it doesn't finish in three seconds. So then you, you've been thinking what happened. Uh, so I just clicked play. And the network is now trying to like uh, train itself. And you can see that after about 200 iterations, I stopped it. It successfully learned that all the points inside here, the inner circle should be positive, and then the, the exterior is all negative. And uh, I want to mention that everything here is, uh, is interactive. And um, 
the nodes here, the neurons of the network are represented as squares, and the weights are uh, of the actual network are here represented as links connecting you know a node from the left and right. Uh, we use we were very careful to not confuse the user and use just one color map. So there is one color map that explains the data, um, also the weights, and also the output of the network. And that's why we chose uh, that. The, and this color map is negative uh, minus one and, and, and less than that is orange, zero is grayish, uh, white, and then <coughs> positive example is blue, and anything above that is blue. So in a way you can see that the background here is what the network thinks it is, then the actual edges are also, or the connections in this network, the weights are also colored. And then um, we even the bias uh, term, if I zoom in, you can see it here, we show the bias. You can hover over and see its value is also following that color map. Uh, we can, uh, you can see that each node here has some little picture inside that node, and that is just, if we were to take that node and make that the output of the network, what would that node show, show us? And we can actually hover over that node, like I'm hovering right now, and on the right, we can see uh, a zoomed in version, expanded version of the output of the network if that node were, was the final node. So what did that node learn like? And you can see here that in this case, the network is a combination of those two nodes. And that's why these edges or weights that connected to the final one are both used. And everything here is, um, you can easily manipulate. So if I click here on this weight and I try to change its value, I can instantaneously see how that would affect the network. And this is sort of like the principle, uh, that follows the principle of directly manipulating and seeing what happens. Um, the other thing that we can do is, I can just change quickly the learning rate and just uh, reset the network and click play. I, I purposely chose a very high learning rate so you can see that the network is kind of unstable. But it did stabilize, it didn't get quite the idea. Uh, the weights are very high but uh, it's, um, it's very educational for someone to just see that like putting a high learning rate can cause this kind of behavior. I can also add uh, hidden layers and I can also add neurons for each hidden layer. So let's say I do this. Um, I can click play and actually the learning rate is pretty high. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lower that and click play. Um, I am actually gonna reset the network and just and you can see that the network learned something. But what is interesting here is that um, I, if you look at the internals of each node, um, there is redundancy. If I go on the very next to last, um, uh, the very last layer, all of these nodes learned the circle. And some of them learned the inverse, so that's why there is a negative weight. Because if this learned the opposite of what the true answer is, then multiplied by a negative number would give us the true one. So what we can do is actually put this weight to zero kill a lot of these um, signals and the network is still, by the way the network is still training while I'm doing this. So I can completely try to kill the network or put a positive value here and then the network is going to adjust itself uh, because I haven't stopped uh, um, running the network. Um, I wanted to show uh, just demo regularization. If I put some regularization here, L1, which usually induces sparsity or tries to uh, have a lot of the weights be uh, zeros. And if I click play, you um, will actually see that as the network is training, and we can leave, leave it for a little bit, only a few of the, of the weights uh, survived. And a lot of these internal links here are close to zero. Um, or practically zero. So you can see now the network only learned to use one, only one node in the, in the last layer, which is kind of interesting. Um, the other thing I want to show is that there are other data sets. Um, one is the XOR data set, like you can click play and, and you can see the network trying to learn the, the, the two quadrants. And we have trickier data sets in there. And um, this one, um, the spiral, actually, when we launched this, uh, 
the internet went crazy over this. Uh, how do you solve the spiral and how do you tune the network to figure out <laughs> this spiral uh, with the minimum number of iterations? And uh, there were a lot of discussions on Reddit and Hacker News about this. And I loved reading that because people were very curious to learn like and sharing also their solutions to other people of how did you crack the spiral. And to give you one hint is actually surprisingly or not surprisingly, if you add noise, to the data set, like make it more noisy. It actually helps uh, a lot to learn at least this spiral. Um, so I just want to share one more thing, one comment that I really, really liked um, from, uh, this is from Hacker News. Um, this person took, uh, tried to explain deep learning, uh, the difference between deep learning and just shallow models uh, using playground. And he says, the Swiss roll problem nicely il illustrates the idea in deep learning. Before deep learning, people would manually design extra features. And he actually has the playground here with all these features enabled, sine x, x1 squared, x2 squared, and then use a shallow network, only one layer. And then the network is going to successfully learn the spiral. Then the user says, deep learning guys realize you don't need to engineer all these extra features. You can just use basic features, x1 and x2. And he actually shows uh, a run of the playground where he only uses those two. And then a deeper network. And then says, then the network should figure out all the other um, intermediate features. And both of these approaches work well. He achieved a, low lo um, um, a small loss. The difference is uh, how do you want to do manual feature design or um, learn? And then the, the follow-up comment was, I think I learned more from your post of your two images than poking at the site for an hour, which actually tells us that even though we gave this to users, the perfect combination would be having lessons, design lessons that can guide users through reproducing some of these uh, results. And with that, I'll... Um, I'll leave it for questions. Thank you. OK, so maybe we can have one question also. Yes, so that's, oh, sorry, you need to talk about that. Thank you for the great presentation. Uh, so is this, uh, uh, behind this demo is a TensorFlow uh, code for model training? And also, what kind of uh, network you know, structure is supported? Uh, so the question is, is uh, this code um, using TensorFlow in the background? And um, actually, it is not. It is using a very small um, library that we wrote um, in JavaScript, fully in JavaScript, that can run some of the basic operations, such as fully connected layers. But there is no convolution. You can't do convolutions yet. We hope that we can add those operators later. Uh, let's thank the speaker again.